Good evening. It is my pleasure to not just be here to welcome you, but to be amongst you to get to hear David and Anne uh, present tonight. So this is the Geneva Lecture Series. And uh, as mentioned, tonight our series features writer, author, and editor, editor-in-chief of Comment Magazine, Anne Snyder. And New York Times columnist, best-selling author, and PBS NewsHour commentator, David Brooks. So Anne and David are part of a long list of influential Geneva lecturers dating back to the 1970s, thanks to the work of Geneva founder Jason Chen, who is gracing us with his presence here tonight. There you go. Thank Jason. So that list includes guests like Cornell West, Marilyn Robinson, Paul Schrader, Madeline Engel, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Richard Mao, Brian Stevenson, and many others. We are thankful to you, Anne and David, for coming to Iowa to join that list, let alone in January of all months. It's been kind of a running joke throughout the day. It's no small feat by any means, and we, we really appreciate it, so thank you. So my name, uh, as Eli mentioned, is Brett Erickson, and along with my wife, Leanne Erickson, who is here, who has been really the one behind the scenes making this happen, uh, we direct Geneva, and it's a campus ministry here at Iowa that seeks to engage learning and life with the good news of Jesus Christ. And if I don't know you, I would love to connect with you to hear your story and to see how we might dream and scheme to continue to bring other great human beings here to the University of Iowa like Anne and David. So please uh, go to that table in the back. If you uh, two great students would raise your hand. They're passing out uh, information about upcoming events, contact cards. So please uh, do not be bashful to, to connect with me. Uh, Anne and David, like I said, we are thankful that you are here. You've been able to unite six different university partners and a campus ministry in sponsorship of this event. And with that, we'd like to thank Christopher Hawkins, Kelly Sukup, Elijah Reddington, Grace Nordahl, and the University of Iowa Lecture Committee, who have been very instrumental in making this happen tonight, Melissa Tully in the, in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, the Public Policy Center, the Department of Religious Studies, the Department of Political Science, and the College of Law. That's a fantastic cast to be a part of, so we thank you so much. Additionally, yes, we can clap for that. Additionally, we are grateful for many individual donors that through Geneva made tonight possible. Thanks also to Ty Coleman and City Channel 4 for recording tonight's lecture. Okay, yeah, we'll give it up Ty. Ty, you're kind of a local legend around here, but you knew that. And so this will be available on Geneva's YouTube channel in the coming weeks, and you'll probably see it then broadcasted on City Channel 4 as well. So for those interested, Geneva is an entirely fundraised nonprofit organization. So if you would like to see more lectures like this one. There is, again, information on the table in the back, and we encourage you to check that out. So, all right, now for the sake of having more time to hear from Anne and David and not me, I will leave you with this, in part because it's impossible for me, uh, and I have to confess this, to not quote C.S. Lewis when addressing an audience. So you have to bear with me here. Um, but in his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis writes, it may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken." It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Thus, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. 
So that should put a little pressure on you as you look to your left and your right, okay? But I read this quote because the way we see one another matters. Anne and David's work is helping us see our neighbor better, which might be exactly what is needed for real, lasting renewal to happen. Anne and David are helping illuminate a better way by which we can see each other, not as objects or cases, enemies or opponents, stepping stones or as a means to an end. They're helping us see one another as humans, and in that, helping us better understand what it means to be human. So without further ado, two glorious humans, Ann Snyder and David Brooks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett. It is wonderful to be here. I want to ask a big question to begin with, which is one that has actually been haunting me since October 7th, and that is, is it possible for peace to walk in power anymore? The horrors of October 7th, that, the horrors of that day for Israel, followed by a retribution that will no doubt scar generations of Palestinians, have been, I think, a living hell for a lot of us. Inhabiting the Christian faith as I do an ocean away the last number of months has felt frustratingly weak to me, impotent and ponderous at times, a kind of prayer for both sides kind of luxury. What does Christ actually require of his followers in times like these? Call it tragedy or providence, but just before Hamas terrorized Israel, I had determined that it was time for this magazine I lead that Brett was mentioning, Comment, which is a journal of public theology for the common good, to explore the dynamics of violence in our own society. Not because violence is anything new, obviously, but because it seems to have grown into an untreated tumor in the North American headspace, dominating our news feeds, lurking behind our big decisions, and striking the public spaces, schools, grocery stores, bowling alleys, music festivals, whose repeated massacres ever more deeply traumatize the public square that so much of comments work, and my own work, labors to heal. Human beings properly fear violence, all forms of it. But what feels like a less healthy development is how much violence itself, avoiding harm, or threatening harm is increasingly dictating the norms by which we negotiate a common life. Some of this is a legitimate response to current realities. Large scale wars are being waged in our world. Ukraine, Gaza, Sudan, Myanmar with threat of course of a broader tinderbox exploding in the Middle East, all of which destabilize our background sense of security. Closer to home, I confess I can no longer select a melon in the produce aisle without turning my head every half second, or maybe more realistically every few seconds, to gauge an escape route should gunshots ring out. Our richest and most unequal cities have suffered an exodus, the second most common reason cited by those leaving Seattle, Washington DC where we live, New York City, and San Francisco is safety and security. The first reason is housing affordability. <laughs> For those trapped in neighborhoods long scourged by poverty, racism, gun violence, and drugs, the days, of course, are distorted by ever-present danger. But some of our obsession with harm these days, of constantly anticipating injury, of presuming a defensive posture instead of leaning into an open, more charitable posture, some of this is narrative-driven. As the white blood cells of a healthy society disappear, loving communities, trustworthy leaders, and everyday kindness, our individual ability to weather turbulence also frays. We start to crave a story with clear villains and victims, and we start trading in predictions. We become vulnerable to a media complex perfectly calibrated to exploit this vulnerability to politicians eager to feed off of it, 
to conspiracies and demonization and the satisfying sense of moral clarity and belonging that scapegoating can bring. And sooner or later, we all find ourselves kind of squatting at the edge of anticipated apocalypse, feeling alone, yet also somehow collectively petrified. Eight out of 10 Americans right now believe that the US faces a threat to its democracy from different sides of that spectrum, politically. Since 2021, one in four Americans have come to believe that political violence is justified to save the country. When members of Generation Z are asked, can other people be trusted, only 19% of them say yes, while 51% say that, quote, some people deserve to be canceled. Two thirds of Americans now own a gun or could see themselves buying one in the future, with 72% of them explaining that they just feel an increased need to protect themselves. I just sometimes wonder if we're all walking around with untreated PTSD. We have just become addicted to threat perception, forgetting the skills and dispositions required to imagine a more generous peace. Is there a recovery plan? In a time of sleepwalking, despair, and division, is renewal, and crucially, growing the mindset and skills of sight and will that renewal requires, is it possible? David's going to enlighten us with the skills and dispositions each one of us might cultivate to combat kind of our national soul sickness and sow into a healthier common life. But somewhere along the way of my own life and pattern recognition, I've just been humbled by how difficult it is to flower in virtue, let alone sustain the character and pro-social behaviors by myself. The forces that are tempting me, probably tempting a lot of you, to shut down and curl inward are just too powerful. Social media and its scaled up distortions, ideologies that essentialize individual uniqueness into group-based caricature, constant distraction and busyness, an instrumentalist culture that idolizes efficiency and productivity at the expense of patient relationship and attentive presence, disembodied communications devoid of context and also risk, apocalyptic headlines, a complete and utter lack of morally inspiring public leaders. We just need a real fleshly context to participate in, just one context that inspires our generosity while making us feel seen, safe, and cherished. We need, in the words of Peter Morin to Dorothy Day, one of my heroes, as he was planting this idea in her head that would become the Catholic worker, quote, to create a society in which it's just easier to be good. I would edit this slightly to say we need to create a society in which it's easier to be human. To be human is to be called by a name, not a number. It is to be attached to another, usually multiple others, and to negotiate the evolving shape of these attachments over a lifetime. It is to be perceived as legitimate, as a full participant in a family, a community, a workplace, a country. It is to have freedom to choose between good and evil and to be capable of hurting or healing another. It is to be fragile, embodied, limited, mortal. It is to seek and make meaning, to feel pain, to desire, to honor, to worship. It is to hope that we are, each one of us, particular and unrepeatable, even as we are desperate to know that we're never actually alone. I recently was back, just nine days ago actually, visiting one of the places I go when I need to not just be reminded of what rehumanization in the face of dehumanization requires, what peace displacing a history of kind of mutual endangerment and violence can look like, but a place that I go when I myself need to be reinvigorated in the habits, choices, and just the broader conditions required to um, not let this present darkness overtake the light. That place is Shreveport, Louisiana, and it is the home of a remarkable reweaving effort that's been going on now for over three decades called Community Renewal International, which I liken to kind of a 21st century uh, reincarnation of Jane Addams' Settlement House movement, for those of you familiar with that. 
I want to show you, if you'll let me, uh, a brief glimpse of community renewal in practice, just to give you a picture of civic generosity that answers yes to this question that has been haunting me. Is it possible for peace to walk in power anymore? This is a rendering by uh, CBS This Morning, produced and released in July of 2020. So upwards of 60,000 residents of Shreveport, Louisiana now consider themselves part of this renewing movement, a gentle but coordinated and visible army of community shepherds committed to walking together across differences in wealth, politics, skin color, human personality. It's honestly really hard to convey just how contagious the joy is in the atmosphere, how deeply dignified and cared for you feel upon entering this moral ecology. But it didn't get planted overnight, and it didn't just randomly sprout. Somewhere along the way, a disenchanted pastor, Mac there, decided to put Jesus' principles to the test, and he kept at them in boundary-crossing care and persistence and gradually discovered that love lived works, and better yet, that love lived together ultimately wins. For 30 years now, community renewal has applied an almost scientific rigor to the rules of positive relationships in order to scale them citywide. Understanding that our relationships are never static, they are either growing or receding, but they never just lie, understanding that our relationships require positive intentional int attention in the normal times. We can't assume their most heroic qualities will magically activate in a crisis or a natural disaster. And three, crucially, understanding that positive, growing relationships require us sharing things in common so that eventually we can celebrate our differences and not feel threatened by them. Thankfully, Shreveport, while it is a picture of maturity and inspiration of what can happen when we intentionally turn towards the call of community and experience the further up and further in renewal of relationship, character, and even spirit, renewal of spirit that I think true community nourished across time and place can bring, thankfully, it's not just a lone light. My vocation has somehow wound up being one kind of compounding gift over and over and encountering and being asked to describe, sort of lift up the logic of those seedbeds like community renewal that are yielding regenerated human beings. And when those regenerated souls are in purposeful friendship with one another at local levels, sometimes national levels, seeing from there the potential for a regenerated public square from addiction rehabilitation efforts to rigorous therapeutic communities that are successfully people who were once mired in crime out into becoming self-respecting generative citizens, from police departments in various cities that are reforming their own behavioral cultures and reframing our debates around mental health and racial bias, to interventions addressing homelessness that just inspire regular, everyday people like you and me to shelter the unhoused in their own backyards and expand their block's understanding of who a neighbor can be. From visionary CEOs working together with pastors and social workers to turn city wards racked by gun violence into neighborhoods that are safe and connected, to classical Christian schools figuring out how to offer an education of beauty and enchantment to all. The examples are legion, present in every region, led by people who are not just dissenting to a creed with their mouths, but exercising a logic with their lives. And as I have hovered around their joy, I have discovered some common nutrients. Nutrients that, if they were to be bottled up and disseminated as sort of a blueprint for cultural regeneration, might just spark a much needed wave of peace walking in power, of rehumanizing waters filling the desert of a dehumanized land. I'm going to present them to you by way of 
closing here, of my own closing and bridge to David's remarks. And I'm going to present them to you in the form of questions so that you might hear them as an invitation just to ponder whether or not what I'm naming as a, as a set of principles or ingredients, do they approximate a community, initiative, cause, or movement um, that you're involved with either here in Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, this broader region, that is seeking to help us move to be very dramatic, not towards war, but towards renewal. So here they are. Things that I've observed in all sorts of efforts, kind of like this community renewal you just saw. One, a dream for all. Is there a logic concerned with the moral transformation of everyone, not just the protection of some? Is there a constructive vision elevated by a transcendent pulse? a tea loss anchored in love. Two, personalism. Are the called welcomed into conversion themselves, where the transformation of their own hearts and minds is the basis for changing the state of play for others? Three, embodiment. Is there an attempt to create an alternative world that, approximate the, that approximates the vision? with boundaries, norms, and rituals established for a group of the willing to become the change they seek out in the world. Moral articulation, are behavioral norms articulated clearly? Is there an aspirational identity named and modeled? Co-creation, are there opportunities for creative expression in song, art, and collaborative work? Truth-telling. Has a space been created to tell and receive the truth? Is there a structure for forgiveness and mutual accountability? Proximity to pain. Are participants close to those who suffer? Sacrifice. Is the leader willing to lead vulnerably and sacrificially? Is the leader practicing what he or she is preaching? Nine, concreteness. Does the leader have the clarity of conviction to speak plainly? from the wisdom earned from working within particular trenches, foregoing abstractions, anonymity, and vague verbiage. That's someone who lives in DC, so that's a little soapbox about that. <laughs> Holy friendship. Does the leader maintain a multi-generational circle of friends who will encourage, admonish, and speak truth to him or her in private? An unlikely community. Is the seedbed community intentional about inviting different ways of knowing? skill sets, and vocational roles? Is it leavened by those our world often considers weak? Social architecture, is there a vision for organizational coordination? Does it have a strategy to affect the grain of organizations and not simply convene and nourish the individual leaders at the tippy top? 13, competence, does it value mastery of a domain, deploying excellence and craft toward the fulfillment of a dream? Wisdom about time, is the seedbed community patient? Does it take the long view that understands the important role of the hidden and the underground, even as it is vigilant in moral formation and trust building so as to be resourceful when crises come? We're almost finished here. Number 15, children. Are children carried by the community, if not in work and presence, then in conscience and telos? And then finally, fruit. Is the life of the seedbed leading to whole and integrated persons, reconciled relationships, a spillover of vitality and deep connection? Are selfishness, pride, stagnancy, and chaos actively fading out? There you are, a little recipe, not to war, but to renewal. Go ahead. Anne needs to stand up here longer after the, her speech so she can hear the applause. So. Um, I didn't know quite what Anne was going to say, but we have a familiar breakdown, division of labor. Anne tends to talk about what makes a healthy community, a healthy organization, a healthy company. And I, so she does social change on the big scale. And I tend to somehow think about social scale, change on the small scale. And the individual transformation and individual connection. So with Mac's organization, you saw how a community was created. 
But while the nuts and bolts of community to me are the actual interactions, it's one person talking to another, one person hosting another, having dinner with a kid. And so I'm gonna talk about how to do the kind of personal interactions that make for renewal. Now, those who know me know I am completely unqualified for the subject. Uh, if you saw that movie Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. They're always singing and laughing and dancing. I grew up in the other kind of Jewish family. The culture in our home was think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and so we were sort of reserved, stiff upper lip. And then in nursery school, the nursery school teacher told my parents apparently, David doesn't really play with the other kids. Uh, he just observes them. <laughs> Which was great for a career in journalism, but not always the, the sort of thing that leads to deep connection and natural social intimacy. Then when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, and I decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer, uh, which is an inherently solitary profession. And writing became the core of my identity. I remember when I was uh, about 17, I wanted, in high school I would date this woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> uh, so those were my values. And then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, if anything, you know, if you know about Chicago, it's a very cerebral and not so much social place. The favorite saying about Chicago, it's where fun goes to die. Uh, my favorite saying, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. So, and so it was cerebral and I fit right in. I had a double major in Chicago in history and celibacy while I was there. Um, and then I went into journalism. Uh, and, that, and I went to a cerebral place. I went, became a conservative columnist at the New York Times, a job I likened to being chief rabbi in Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. And then I got a job on TV, but I got a job on the most cerebral show on TV, the PBS NewsHour. We have like 12, 14 minute conversations. And we have a great audience. I think they're very intellectual. Uh, they're somewhat seasoned. Uh, and so if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. <laughs> and, so that's... and so this is a pretty, um, uh, a pretty cerebral, aloof mode of life. And somewhere around middle age, I decided it was inadequate. If you seal yourself off from emotional intimacy and the kind of connection that we saw in Shreveport, you're sealing yourself off from life itself. So I set out to sort of improve my life. And I did it the University of Chicago way. I wrote a lot of books about improving your life. <laughs> so I wrote a book about emotion called The Social Animal. I wrote a book on character formation called The Road to Character. And I learned in that book that writing a book doesn't actually give you good character. Uh, and even reading a book doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. And so <laughs> They'll be available for sale later in the evening. <laughs> and it sort of worked. And I can prove it to you, but I'm going to drop two names. Uh, I've been interviewed by Oprah twice in my life. And the second one was in 2019. Uh, and uh, after the second interview, she pulled me aside and said, David, I've rarely seen anybody change so much in middle age. You were so emotionally blocked before. And that was a good moment for me. I just felt like, oh, I've grown. And then I remember uh, just before COVID, I was at a, a book event in uh, sort of a conference in Nantucket, and they handed out lyrics to a song sheet. Uh, and they were, it was a love song, and the, the person organizing the conference said, okay, pick a neighbor in the crowd and sing the love song into their eyes. If you had asked me to do this when I was 30, I would have spontaneously combusted. Uh, and yet, you know, I did it. So it is possible to grow. Actually, just yesterday, I was on the Today Show, more name dropping. And this Hoda, if you know her, she's like the mo warmest human being on the face of the earth. At the end of the interview, she says to me, David, I love you. And I said, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm not in the business of telling people on national TV I love, especially if I don't really know them. But it was a warm moment. I've, I've become a little warmer. The sad thing is, as, um, as I've become a little more human, American society, as Anne referred to in the beginning of her remarks, has becoming a little more dehumanized. And so I focus on a lot of sad statistics, some of which Anne has already given you. Uh, 
Depression rates, you know, have been skyrocketing. Suicide rates have been skyrocketing. 36% of Americans say they're lonely frequently or almost all the time. 45% of teenagers say they're persistently sad and despondent. The percentage of Americans who say they have no close personal friends has risen by four times since 2000. The number of Americans who say no one knows me well is 54%. The share of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category has risen by 50% since 2000. So this is just some sort of social and relational crisis. And those sad statistics I give you, I could give you a bunch of mean statistics, because people who feel invisible and unseen regard it as injustice, which it is, and they want to lash out. So what's happening? Well, I could tell you a technology story. Social media is driving us all crazy. I could tell you really the story Ann just told you, which is a sociology story, which is we used to hang out in community. We used to be active in a community. We used to be active in civic group. And frankly, more of us attended church. And now that's all going down and with it connections. I have a weird theory I've never seen any evidence for, which is we used to, more of us used to live in extended families. And if you had to deal with your crazy uncle Don, then you had some social ability to build relationship. But I'm going to tell you the most direct story, which is we have raised several generations who are untrained in the specific minor social skills of how to treat each other with consideration and respect. That it's the act of being considerate to other in the complex circumstances of life that we're in a recession. And some of these skills are just simple. How to be a good listener. How to end conversations gracefully. How to sit one with someone who's depressed or grieving how to ask for an offer of forgiveness, how to break up with somebody without crushing their heart, how to host a party where everybody feels included. These are social skills just as much as learning carpentry or learning to play tennis are skills. You just have to know how to do stuff. So how good are you at these skills? Well, I've met some of you over the course of the day, but I, I don't know most of you, but I can say this with a lot of confidence. You're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> There's a guy at the University of Texas who studies this. The average person, when we meet somebody and have a first conversation, we accurately predict what's going on in their mind 22% of the time. Some people are pretty good. They're 55%. Some people are 0%, but think they're 100%. They're socially clueless. And so the way I've looked at it is in any group of people, there are some people who are diminishers, and there are some people who are illuminators. Diminishers are people who are not curious about you, they stereotype, they ignore, they make you feel unseen. Other people, on the other hand, are illuminators. They're curious about you. They ask you questions. Sometimes I leave a party and I think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I've come to think only about 30, 40% of humanity are question askers. The rest are perfectly nice people. They just don't ask you questions. But the illuminators do. The illuminators just make you feel respected and lit up. There was a novelist who lived about 100 years ago named Ian e. Foster. His biographer wrote of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity you had to be your most honest, sharpest, best self. Imagine one to be able to do to listen that intensely to people. There was a woman named Jenny Jerome, who would, a young American woman who moved to England in the 19th century and would later go on to become Winston Churchill's mother. But when she was a young woman, she was uh, uh, invited to a dinner party and happened to be seated next to the Prime Minister, William Gladstone. And she left that dinner thinking Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. And then a couple weeks later, she's invited to another dinner and she happens to be seated ne next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she leaves that dinner thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. <laughs> so it's nice to be Gladstone, better be Disraeli. That guy's an illuminator. So how do you go about getting better at this? Well, I'll just walk you through a, first, a few of the steps. The first is the first meeting. You're just meeting somebody, or you're just seeing them after a little while, you haven't seen them. And so when you meet somebody, everybody is asking themselves an unconscious question. Will this person be kind to me? Am I a priority to this person? Am I a person to this person? And see, the answers to those questions is expressed in the eyes before any words come out of your mouth. And so the power of gaze. Simone Weil said, attention is a moral act. Well, the way you attend creates the person you're seeing, you're going to see. And so I was down in Waco, Texas, 
and I was having breakfast with a lady named LaRue Dorsey, this 93-year-old educator, and she presented herself to me as a stern disciplinarian. She told me I loved my students enough to discipline them. And I was intimidated by her. Into the bar, into the diner, you can see where my head's at, uh, <laughs> In walks a guy named Jimmy Durrell, who's a pastor. He serves the homeless, has, builds a church under a highway overpass where the homeless live. Um, and he walks up to our table. He knows us both. And he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders. And he shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. I love you. And that stern drill sergeant lady I'd been talking to turns into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. He brought out a totally different version of her, just with that affection. And part of it is he's just got a warmer personality than me. But part of it is he is a pastor. And so he sees anybody, anybody he meets, he's, he's seeing someone made in the image of God. He's looking into the face of God. He's looking at somebody with a soul of infinite value and dignity and immortal. And he's looking at somebody so important that Jesus was willing to die for that person. And you can be atheist, Jewish, Christian, agnostic, Buddhist, whatever, but looking at people with that level of respect and reverence is an absolute precondition for seeing them well. The second stage is just hanging out. Most of our life is not, we're not having heart to heart talks, we're just hanging out, having casual conversations. And there's a word that Pope Francis loves called accompaniment which is an other-centered way of being in normal life. Think of the way a pianist accompanies the singer. He's paying attention, he's just trying to make her shine. And accompany, people who are accompanying you are putting you first, and they're just delightful to be around. We have friends in DC who say, we like our friends to be lingerable. The kind of people you just want to linger with. They're just good company. And that's just a pleasurable way to be with other people. Sometimes accompaniment is um, a little more dramatic. I had a student at Yale, I had her as a graduate student, and when she was in college, her dad got pancreatic cancer. And they had conversations about how he would probably miss the big events of her life. And um, after college, she was invited to be a bridesmaid for one of her friend's wedding. And she watched in the wedding how the, the dad of the wedding gave a beautiful toast to his daughter. And then, uh, it came time for the father-daughter dance. And Jillian decided, oh, it was just too tough. And so she decided to leave the table and go to the ladies' room to have a cry. And when she came out of the ladies' room, every single person who'd been at her table and the adjoining table was standing there in the hallway. And she let me quote what, she wrote a paper about this event, she let me quote what happened next. What I will remember forever is that no one said a word. Each person, including newer boyfriends who I knew less well, gave me a reaffirming hug and headed back to their table. No one lingered or awkwardly tried to validate my grief. They were there for me just for a moment, and it was exactly what I needed. So somebody at one of those two tables said, let's get up and be there for Jillian when she gets out of the bathroom. And that's a beautiful, just, that's what accompaniment is. The third part of getting to know someone and building community and building connection is conversation. You can't imagine what's going on in somebody else's head. You have to ask them. You have to be good at conversation. And so how good are you at conversation? Again, probably not as good as you think you are. As Anne mentioned, in DC, we live not only in the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth, we live in the city with a lot of the worst conversationalists. So I was on the phone during the Obama years with a friend of mine who worked in the administration. And we're having a conversation about something I can't remember. And the call drops, I'm on my cell phone. And the call drops, so I think, oh, they'll call me back in a minute or two. So I wait, two minutes go by, five minutes go by, six minutes go by. Finally, I call his office, and his assistant says to me, oh, I'm sorry, he can't talk to you, he's on the phone. <laughs> and I say to her, no, he's on the phone with me. He's been bloviating for 10 minutes. He does not know I'm not on the other line. <laughs> and so we have a lot of that. So how can you be a better conversationalist? I collected a bunch of these very specific social skills that I think are pretty key to building connection. The first, treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. If you're with somebody, be with them 100% or 0%, don't try to 60% of them. Be a loud listener. Anne and I have a friend named Andy Crouch, 
When you talk to him, it's like talking to one of those charismatic Pentecostal churches. He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, yes. Amen, amen to that, preach that. Love talking to that guy. <laughs> Might not work in the Midwest, to be fair. But, uh, <laughs> make them authors, not witnesses. When somebody tells you a story, they don't go into enough detail. So say, uh, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that? And suddenly they're in the scene and they're narrating you a story. And if you can get people in a narrative mode, then you're really gonna learn something. Don't fear the pause. If we're having an important conversation and my conversational comment starts at my shoulder and goes to my fingertips, at what point have you stopped listening so you can think of what to say? Probably about here. So if it's important, let me talk to my fingertips, pause, think about it, and then respond. It's a show of respect. Don't be a topper. This is the one everybody does. If you say to me, you know, I just had a horrible flight. We sat on the tarmac for two hours. I say, oh, I know what you went through. I had a horrible flight. We sat on the tarmac for six hours. <laughs> and it sounds like I'm trying to relate to you, but really what I'm doing is let's stop talking about your experience. Let's start talking about my superior experiences. So don't be a topper. Keep the gem statement in the center. If my brother and I are, are disagreeing about our dad's health care, there's something deep down that we agree upon. And that's what we both want, what's best for our dad. If we return to that, the gem statement, then we save our relationship amid a disagreement. Finally, the most important part of a, a good conversation is the questions. The questions determine the quality of the conversation. And so, I hope that's not me. Um, <laughs> I have a friend named Naomi Way who teaches seventh grade boys in New York how to be journalists, how to interview. And the first time she ever did this, she sat up in the front of the room uh, and she said to the boys, um, okay, you can ask me any question and I will answer it honestly. So the first question was, are you married? She said, no. Second question from another boy was, are you divorced? She said, yes. Third question from another boy was, do you still love him? She's like, whoa. Where <laughs> And she cried and said, yes. Fourth question, does he know? Do your kids know? They just kept hammering at her. <laughs> kids are great question askers. All of us could get better. One of the keys to asking questions, as I said, is getting people in narrative mode. So even as a political journalist, I no longer ask people, what do you believe about this? I ask, how did you come to believe that? That gets people telling me a story about their values or some experience they had. It's much more interesting. In a book called You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy, I read about a focus group moderator who was hired by grocery stores to um, uh, figure out why people go to the grocery store late at night. And she could have said, why do you go to the grocery store late at night? But she didn't. She asked a storytelling question. Tell me about the last time you went to a grocery store after 11 p.m. And there was a woman in the focus group who hadn't said anything to that point. Uh, and she said, well, I'd smoked a joint and I needed a menage a trois with B. Ben and Jerry. And so she told a little story about her life. The best questions once you get to know somebody are sort of 30,000 feet questions. Questions where you, um, you ask questions that they get to think about their life from a different perspective. And those are questions like, what crossroads are you at? What transition are you in the middle of? Uh, if we met a year from now, what would we be celebrating? If this five years is a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? And those are just good questions and they're fun to ask. We had a dinner party uh, and I asked, how do your ancestors show up in your life? And you can talk about your Dutch heritage or whatever your heritage is, and you can figure out, I talked about my Jewish heritage, you can figure out how do the ancestors shape how I see and act in the world? And so those are all questions that just take an average conversation and make it into a memorable conversation. Now, so far I've talked about conversations that are, happen in tranquil times. But we of course don't live in tranquil times. We live in hard times with hard conversations. And so we often have conversations across ideological difference, across class difference, across ethnic difference, and sometimes they're hard. When I walk into the room, I walk in with the baggage that I carry because of my professions. I walk in with the New York Times, Yale University, PBS, the Aspen Institute. You have never met, never met, never met a human being with it, as many elite progressive associations as I have. And so people co sometimes come at me from left to right and say, you're part of systems that are ruining this country. And my instinct is to get defensive. 
and say, hey, I'm one of the good guys here. You should know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help. But I've learned my first job when talking across difference is to stand in their standpoint. It's to ask them three or four or five times, tell me more about your point of view. What am I missing? Tell me more. And if you ask that question in different words each time, you get a better answer in the fifth time than the first time. And you really learn a lot about where that person's coming from. I'm a big fan of a book called Crucial Conversations. And they say, in any conversation, respect is like air. If it's present, nobody notices. If it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so show respect. In every conversation, they say, there's two levels. There's the nominal level of what we're talking about. Then the, there's the underlying flow of emotions between us as we speak. So when you're having that kind of conversation, what's the underlying flow? Am I making the other, people, other person feel more safe or less safe, more ref respected or less respected? And I have rarely found, no matter how hard people come, if you lead with respect they, and you lead with trust, they, they come back to you with respect and trust. So I often ask people about times when they uh, felt seen and understood, when that level of connection happened, when community was built on the micro level. Uh, and they tell me sometimes stories that are not that remarkable. I had a friend who told me a story about a second grade daughter who was struggling in school. And one day the teacher said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that one little comment turned the girl's whole year around because it took what she thought was a, a weakness, her social awkwardness, and it made it seem like thoughtfulness. The teacher really gets me. When I heard that story, um, I thought of my own 11th grade teacher, uh, uh, Mrs. Dustat, and I was being a smart ass in school, uh, and I said something in class, and she said in front of the whole class, David, you're trying to get by on glibness, stop it. On the one hand, I felt humiliated in front of the whole class, on the other hand, I, I felt honored. Wow, she really gets me. I'm not like <laughs> <laughs> Another uh, example of somebody getting someone uh, I read about from a rabbi, Rabbi Elliot Kukla. Uh, and he tells a story about a woman in his congregation who had a brain injury and as a result sometimes just fell to the ground. And people rushed to pick her up. And she told Kukla, I think people rush to help me up because they are so uncomfortable with seeing an adult lying on the floor. But what I really need is for someone to get down on the ground with me. And that's empathy. Not doing what makes you comfortable, but getting down on the ground, sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically. Sometimes in a history book, I'll run across an example of somebody who just got somebody else. I was reading this um, history, uh, biography book in the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt had a young 28-year-old Congress, congressman over to the Oval Office for a meeting. And the congressman's name was Lyndon Johnson. And after the meeting, FDR turns to his aide, Harold Ickes, and says, you know, Harold, that's the kind of uninhibited young pro I might have been as a young man if I hadn't gone to Harvard. And then he continued, in the next couple of generations, the balance of power in this country is going to shift to the South and West. And that kid, Lyndon Johnson, could be the first Southwestern president. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. Sometimes the conversations are uh, the moments when people were seen uh, are, are pretty dramatic. I read a book by a woman named Catherine Schultz, a beautiful memoir called Lost and Found. And, and part of it is about her dad, Isaac, who sounds like this just wonderful guy. He was a refugee from World War II, and he came here. I think he became a lawyer. And he sounds like just a colorful, wonderful guy. He had opinions about everything, the infield fly rule in baseball, whether apple cobbler is better than apple crisp. and. He just was, just sounds like a wonderful dad. And at the end of his life, as he was dying, he just went silent. And the doctors couldn't figure out, but he just stopped talking. And so in the final night, the family gathered around him, uh, and they just wanted to say the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And Schultz describes the scene. <clears throat> My father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to the next as we spoke his brown eyes shining with tears. I'd always hated to see him cry and seldom did, but for once I was grateful. It gave me hope for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, I knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he'd always been with his family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. 
So that's a guy who died well seen. And these are just, and when, when people tell me, tell me about these moments, they tell me with eyes shining with joy. And I can tell you, if it's great to be seen, it's also great to be the seer. And so one day, four years ago or so, I don't know, maybe five years ago now, um, I was sitting at our dining room table and I was reading a boring book and Anne walked through the front door and she paused at the door and the door frame was open and the light came from behind her. Uh, and she didn't notice I was there because that's the kind of charisma I have. <laughs> <laughs> and she, her eyes rested on an orchid we keep by the front door. And she was just pondering something. And a sensation went across my mind, which was, I know her. I really know her. And if you had asked me what I knew about her at that moment, I would have had trouble saying. It wasn't a collection of facts about her. It wasn't her personality traits. It wasn't the words I would use to describe her to a stranger. It was sort of the whole flowing of her being. The ebbs and harmonies of her music, the incandescence of her smile, the undercurrents of insecurities, the, sometimes the flashes of fierceness. It was just as if I wasn't seeing her. I was seeing out from her. And to really know someone, you have to be able to see a little how they see the world. And if you had asked me the word I would use to describe how I was looking at her at that moment, the only word I think in the English language is a biblical world, which is the word beholding. I wasn't observing her, I wasn't inspecting her, I was just beholding her. And shortly after this, I told this story to a friend, uh, some friends of mine, and they said, yeah, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just behold them. And anybody who's had that experience, you know how fun it is. So as Anne said, we live in these bitter times. The famous dates of our era are hard, bitter dates. September 11th, January 6th, October 7th. The forces of dehumanization are on the move. And there's a temptation to hunker down. But in my view, it's not naive, even in these times, to lead with curiosity. It's not naive to lead with respect. It's not naive to lead with trust. You will be betrayed. But if you learn and practice these kind of social skills, then you will have more fun in life, better relationships in life. You will build more community. And the accumulative effects will be the social and emotional and maybe even the spiritual renewal of a country that is on the edge. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, David and Anne, for reminding us of our own humanity and of the humanity in others. It is really a gift to be reminded of that tonight, so thank you. Yeah. And now it feels ridiculous to ask you to put your questions into an app on your phone. <laughs> but that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> um, we, if you would, um, go to that website, slido.com, enter that number, and go ahead and put your questions into that <laughs> app. This is absurd. If you don't want to do that, if you have joined a resistance to honor your humanity, I will happily walk around and take your questions on a piece of paper and hand them to our wonderful moderator tonight, who is Dr. Lori Branch, English professor at the University of Iowa, I would say theologian, and all around lovely, lovely human being. So thank you, Dr. Branch, for being with us. And I'll welcome you up and welcome David and Ann back to the stage. Thank you. I wanted to show that I was really listening to David's talk there at the end, and so I want to get you in narrative mode. And I, I would really love you to tell us more about um, this moment, and you, you described it as midlife, whenever you decided that you wanted to be more relational, more engaged with other people, that you wanted to grow in that sense. And you just said, I decided this wasn't a good way to live the way I was living. But I'm just really curious about the, um, the what, what was the catalyst for that? Um, and what what were the relationships or people that gave you hope that, oh, I could do that? It's, I'm not just 
I'm not stuck. I'm not a monolithic personality that cannot change, you know. So yeah, I just yeah. want to hear more about that transformation. I think it was gradual. I think it was first my kids. Oh. Uh, just that you, it's, it's very hard to be emotionally close with your kids. I remember my oldest was born in Brussels and um, we were playing and uh, he was, God bless him, he woke up at four in the morning, uh, every morning for four years. Uh, and Brussels doesn't get light in the winter till like noon. Uh, and so I was playing with him until like 10 or 11 before I went to work. And there was one time he was jumping on my stomach while I was trying to take a nap. Uh, and I had this the thought, another one of my epiphanies, that um, he, uh, I knew him better than I'd known anybody. And he probably knew me better than anybody because I'd been so uninhibited. And he, we'd never exchanged a word because he was like 12 months old. Mm. And so it's really powerful to be able to get to know somebody so well without words. Mm. And then I would say through their childhoods, um, that I had this bifurcated, I was close to them. But then, you know, then they uh, moved off, they grew up, uh, went off to college and workplace. Uh, and my first marriage fell apart. Uh, and I remember living in this drab apartment and having this awareness that I had weekday friends, the kind of friends you, I would go out to lunch and talk politics with, but I didn't have weekend friends, mm -hmm. people just to hang out with, or somebody to call at two in the morning if there was a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was, I think this is not an uncommon guy thing. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of, of this novelist, Frederick Wiechner, who I hope people in this room know. And he had, he had something way worse happen to him, which is his dad took his life when I think Beekner was nine. Mm. Uh, and he went 30 or 40 years without mourning him. He just shut it all down. Uh, and then at a certain point in life, he said, can't do that anymore. And so he had the sort of an emotional rebirth, uh, which he, um, and he, he wrote a book called Telling Secrets. And in that book, he said, what we want most in life is to be seen in our fullness. Mm -hmm. And what we fear most in life is to be seen in our fullness. Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, and he says, sometimes we have to tell, tell our secrets. Because if we tell our secrets, we'll get beneath the fake image we project out of the world and we'll encourage other people to tell their secrets too. Yeah. Uh, and so he's sort of a, a role model for middle age emotional f thawing. <laughs> okay. Great, that's great. I'm gonna look at my questions that I have here coming down. So, oh yeah, lots of thank you, good people. You're helping out here. Oh, now there's so many I hardly know what to do. Um, uh, the the first one I want to get here is I, um, and maybe I can I'll riff some of these. I think probably most of them are gonna be for David because he went last, you know. So it was a longer ago, and that you gave your talk. But um, uh, could you say some more, uh, David? Um, somebody's interested here about your University of Chicago ed education and its influence on you on you mm -hmm. and maybe that partly with respect to this personal interaction or uh, yeah. maybe other things it, it uh, gave me so much it did not give me a lot of fun I think in the four years of my college experience I think I had four beers uh, so <laughs> party school it was not but first uh, it um, my professors had devoted themselves to the life of the mind and they really believe if you read Thucydides, if you read George Eliot's, and if you study these books carefully, you will understand how to live. And so it was a clear sense, as one of my professors, Alan Bloom, said, that yeah. student, what, what Gona education is about is uh, putting everything at risk. You have to assume that every belief and every attachment you have is gonna be re-examined and might change. You have to be willing to risk everything. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely did believe in that. And I remember as an undergrad thinking, I've looked at these men and women, and I thought, I'll never be like that. But there's something amazingly impressive about them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they gave us new things to love, new books to love, new activities to love. They held out the idea of moral formation. They gave us, Anne used the word, moral ecologies. So they didn't tell us what to believe, but they said, well, here's Stoicism, here's Confucianism, here's Marxism. These are all moral ecologies that have been descended to us. Pick one. Uh, and so uh, that, that was a sense that the moral life is, moral transformation is very possible. Uh, and they gave us, and they introduced us to excellence. 
Uh, and you know, some people don't rise to that, their highest potential because they don't have an adequate ideal. Mm. Uh, and so it, just in case after case, they gave us, the, they told us what was worth wanting. Mm. And after you've had the fine wine, then the Kool-Aid doesn't taste as good. Yeah. And so we had a taste of that fine wine and it's been haunting, I think a lot of us ever since. No, I really, I think that's right. I'm sorry, I'm just going to like converse a little bit here. But uh, I mean, I think that's really right that an, an education, it should whet the desire for something good. And, um, and it, it, we, we sell it short for ourselves. I'm talking for college professors here too. We make it into merely job skills or something else. I mean, there's just so much more personal development that should be happening. It's, it's really, and Anne went to a school called Wheaton, which is the University of Chicago, the west side of Chicago, um, <laughs> okay. uh, far west suburbs. Uh, and I, I used to do talks, uh, book talks, and if a young person came up to me and asked a painfully morally earnest question, I would say, did you go to Wheaton College by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a 70% hit rate. Uh, and so it, it was a similar sort of intense atmosphere of, of real, in your case, spiritual as well as intellectual formation. Yeah. So a lot of these questions here, I think we'll open up for both of you here. And uh, a lot of people are asking questions, as you might imagine, about politics. And um, like along the lines of, um, you know, how do we think about our leaders at this point? I mean, do we, do we sort them out between their policies versus their personalities and their integrity? Um, uh, I don't know how we even want to think about how, 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 could, how could we help people think about politics differently than as the war of engagement right now. You know, I mean, they're just warring factions, right, that are opposed to each other. I mean, like, is there anything that we can do, like, on the front end here? And how do we, when our leaders and political candidates think about, in terms of warfare, cultural warfare, I mean, how, how, how can we even engage in the political process? How do you want to? Um, well, first I should say Donald Trump won the New Hampshire primary, if anybody's wondering. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll go back to that word um, that Anne used, the phrase moral ecology, that political leaders set a moral ecology. Uh, and whether you agree with them or disagree with them, the quality of their character sets the tone for the administration. So I, my job is to go in and interview people in one White House to the next. So I've been in that building since Clinton, I guess, except for the Trump years. Uh, and it's funny how, and it's like any company or organ, any organization, I'm sitting in the same rooms with the same walls, and each administration is radically different from the other. Mm. The level of cooperation, the level of team spirit. We had a group of people over our house, the, there were some Trump people who worked in the Trump White House, some people worked in the Obama White House, and I, if my memory serves, one of the women who worked in the Trump White House said, did you guys have any sense of camaraderie in your White House? Because we don't have any of that. And that's astonishing to me because most White Houses have an awesome sense of camaraderie. Military, yeah. Yeah. And so I'll just give an example of moral ecology from my own life, which I hope uh, figure out a lot of you remember. So I started on the news hour in 2001 or so. Uh, and my boss in those days was a guy named Jim Lehrer. And Jim Lehrer set a certain tone for the way we do things on the news hour. And the story I tell is, for the first 10 years when I was on with Jim, if I said something he liked, his eyes would crinkle with pleasure. If I said something crass that was not up to standard, his mouth would turn down with displeasure. So for 10 years, I just tried to chase the eye wrinkle and avoid the mouth downturn. <laughs> and he never had to say anything, but this is just how we do things around here. And Jim's been dead now for several years, but we still have the ecology that he created. We still operate by those standards and norms. And so it's just tremendously powerful. I think all leaders do this. And I think all leaders should have to understand that they're having this massive effect on people around them. Uh, and all the leaders have to affect, they are in the moral formation business. And by leaders, I mean almost all of us. So I'll quote an even higher authority, um, whose name I'm not blanking on, the, the soccer player, the, t the, t the TV Ted show, Lasso. Ted Lasso. Um, <laughs> and so he's asked in the first season uh, by the journalist, um, whatever, from The Independent, something Krim or something like that. You can see how good I am with names. Um, Trent. Trent Krim. Uh, what are your goals for FC Richmond, the soccer team? 
And he says, my goal is to make each of the fellows on this team better versions of themselves on and off the field. And that is a simple but very good description of what moral formation looks like. It's what leaders should all be doing. I just want to make the people around me better versions of themselves. And, and if we have leaders that don't do that, then the decay into selfishness and, and, and violence uh, takes over. And the only thing I would add, um, I think politics is really important for a variety of reasons. I didn't grow up in this country in the first 10 years of my life, so I think it's always just made me, um, there's something about our politics that I fundamentally find so shallow and dysfunctional that I, I really try to get beneath it and not pay as much attention to it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth, so I'm not saying that I'm not proud about that per se, but I think it's a part of trying to stay healthy. Um, I think it's worth reminding Americans, and I say this, my magazine, we serve a mostly American audience, but I have been tutored by, we're actually published by a Canadian think tank, and I've been tutored by a public sphere in another country that is, while it of course has uh, quite a politicized media, and you know, there's plenty of talk about Trudeau, and there is a broader sense that the public sphere is not just dominated by politicians. Like the public leaders, even if Brian Stevenson doesn't get that much play, um, uh, uh, someone who's spoken here before, I think, or, uh, you know, certain, like, big CEOs or certain heroic, I mean, I'm thinking of, like, Atul Gawande or people who have public either platforms or probably more importantly, like, steward positions of influence. Um, the media is not covering them. They, we talk a lot about it. In this country. In this country, the media is like over politicized and under moralized. So I think I, I, I'm reminded of a moment a few months ago. I was talking to a very large, um, happened to be a historically Republican donor who was very uh, concerned um, and at the time was spending a lot of money trying to find another candidate um, who wasn't Trump but on the Republican side. and. He just kept asking, like, where is Lincoln? Where is there a Lincoln in our time? And um, has, are there any pastoral figures who could actually survive our political meat market? And um, we were, it got into an interesting conversation about these other figures that arise and really change the wave morally in a society of, you know, the obvious figures like a Martin Luther King or so on. And we, it, became, it turned into this conversation, can healers, can people who actually have the gift of civic healing Serve, can they operate in a political, mm -hmm. in our current like political logic of warfare? And you know, Lincoln did fight a war and <laughs> wage war, but oversaw that. Um, but I think it, there's something. I, th maybe I shouldn't have brought the American versus Canadian thing here, but I do think it would be nice if we broaden our conception of the public sphere, which does need to be carefully tended, as involving multiple spheres. Um, and I do think journalists have a role to play here and not just focusing on the New Hampshire primary tonight. <laughs> so. That's great. A lot of the questions that are coming through here have to do with, um, it, they really show me that a lot of our listeners took, our, our audience members took the talks to heart and they're thinking about the most difficult kinds of conversations that they would like to have or need to have, um, questions of really profound political difference with people who are near and dear to them. So um, like one uh, very moving question here, which I, don't really, I can't really read at length, you know, talks about how the Hamas war has affected the, the love relationship that the person has, you know, and um, with a Jewish background, uh, other background involved in that. Um, uh, and then, you know, how one question says, how do I discuss politics with Trump supporters who state he can do no wrong? Right. I mean, like, how do I like that just seems so, you know, like extreme or how, how can I discuss with them? And um, I'll stop there. There's some other questions, but like how to engage in those. The, it, how to have a conversation, what I take it to mean here, a conversation with people whose views seems to preclude actually having a conversation about it. Like how can we, how can we try to engage in conversation with a person who has such a stridently, um, I don't know, a black and white or, you know, who doesn't have the mindset that you were talking about that you got at the University of Chicago, which yeah. is that all my views might change if I consider more facts, right? right? How can we help elevate or leaven the nature of the conversations that we're having, even in our intimate relationships? 
Yeah, some people sometimes ask me at Thanksgiving, I'm going to have a conversation with family members across political divides. Yeah. How do I do that? And so my advice always is, well, before you start talking about politics, make the first conversation topic, things I've always resented about you. Yeah. And, and then by the time you get to politics, you'll be fine. You'll yeah. like, oh, that'll seem easy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess my mode is, um, is at my best. And we had an incident of the baseball, a baseball game several years ago where some guy just went off on me, a Trump supporter. Uh, just calling me awful names, was very rude to my son, was very rude to Anne. Uh, and I like, was when my son and I hit him back. And it was, we got our man, our testosterone up. And afterwards, Anne was, I think it's fair to say, you were upset with me. Um, and you thought, no, that's just not the right approach. Uh, and I think in my better moments when my testosterone is not flowing, that's the right, you, you're right about that. And I've had occasions where I, in time since, having learned from that example, um, where I just ask them, I just say, I start with childhood, tell me about where'd you grow up? Uh, and then tell me about your life. And I, I had a guy years and years ago now, probably 2017, 2018, um, from South Dakota who, um, said, let me tell you about the happiest day of my life. And he had worked at a plant, and he, he, they make sort of the casing units that go into the refrigerators. Uh, and he said, I was foreman of this little section of the plant, and they changed the technology in the factory. I was no longer qualified to be foreman, so I got laid off. And so he said, I just wanted to pick up and quietly go away. So he picked up his box, put all his stuff in there, opened his little office door, and 3,600 people, all the employees of the plant, formed a double line from his office door through the plant out in the parking lot to his car door. And he walked through this gauntlet of two lines of people, all of them applauding him as he left. They just wanted to show their appreciation. He said, that was the best day of my life. And that was 35 years ago. Every job I've had since has been worse paying and more undignified, and my life has been going downhill for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah. so he said, that guy might be a jackass, but um, I need a change. Hmm. And so I don't agree with him, but I see where he's coming from. Yeah. And so I often find if you ask people that, it's, you often get a story that you see where you're coming from. And when I have these conversations, I'm always terrified that somebody's going to say, hey, and where do you work? <laughs> <laughs> But as I said before, only 35% of Americans are question askers, so I never get that question. Um, the, the hard thing, and I have a very loved family and member of my family who's a big Trump supporter, is he's got a, a completely enclosed set of facts. Mm -hmm. And I can't get into them, because he's got an answer for everything, and I don't know what are right and what are wrong, but he's got a, a very enclosed set of facts. And they're really all based on uh, immense distrust of authority that if there's an authority out there, it's probably trying to screw us over. Mm. And it, once somebody's got that basic life outlook that all systems of authority are trying to screw us over, it's really hard to argue with that. Mm. Uh, and so it, it's just super hard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to add about that? Yeah. Um, this might uh, be a nice like follow-up to that, but uh, one of the questions uh, really engages this question of technology head on and just says, how do you communicate with those that spend hours looking at their iPhones? Sorry to pick on the Apple <laughs> users. That's what it says. But that, I mean, you know, that I guess that we can broaden that question and just say that, like, how can we all engage? And uh, uh, I don't know more robust conversation, disengage ourselves from the social media that, uh, and to some extent, that is sabotaging our ability to converse with other people. Um, what do you think about that? I think you had more ideas. I felt them lurking underneath mm -hmm. your talk about like, you know, how problematic social, you know, social media and our, our start having all of our human interaction mediated through technology yeah. is, yeah. I mean, I, I don't feel I'm disseminating. I don't know if these are helpful answers here. I think a lot of you here have more wisdom on this than I do. But I, um, I just, my approach is like invite people into a fleshly, beautiful experience together. And it can be an activity, it can be a meal, it can be, but something, and I feel this is like how I deal with teenagers who are like, like, like this, is just create a better experience than that. 
Um, that's, I'm very simple about this, like displace the seeming safety and comfort and lack of risk associated with this to something that, actually speaking of Lewis earlier, what is it, don't settle, don't settle for mud at the beach kind of thing, um, when there you can build sand castles. So that's, I'm just always trying to displace with something that's much more fully orbed. Um, but that doesn't necessarily get into our own self-restraint and um, that's yep. a daily set of choices. We have, a, we have a friend I mentioned, the loud listener guy, Andy Crouch. Maybe you remember some I more of Andy, Andy's rules. Yeah, okay. I was um, happy to hear you. <laughs> and so he has a set of rituals. So he, he always goes outside and looks at the sky before he looks at a screen in the morning. Five minutes, mm. yeah. Uh, and so uh, he'll take a, a tech Sabbath. What is it, an hour a day, a day a week, a month a year? Mm -hmm. And so he'll take tech, tech Sabbaths. Um, I think the main thing we could do right now is uh, ban phones in schools. Uh, just, uh, it, it just has to take it out of the kids' hands when they're in school. Uh, and you would improve the schools, you'd improve their lives. Because of the, the, uh, the conversation there that that would, um, you know, I just want to dilate on Anne's idea a little bit more here because I think that that really, it, it, we're in such a, because technology dominates the information that we take in, right? We, if we think, well, the way I could improve society would be to engage in conversations in my home, to invite people into my home for a one-on-one -on -one encounter, to have more fleshly embodied kinds of conversations, right? But then we have all these forces against us telling us that, oh, well, that can never make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but I, I love that, that we're having this moment here to encourage each one of us. I mean, what if every person who were here in this auditorium engaged in that kind of, you know, um, hospitality giving and fellowship and did that on a regular basis, you know, um, that, that that would make a difference. And, and sometimes I think I'm, I really want to think that that is the only way we can make a difference. No one's going to legislate this kind of care for us, this kind of change of the moral ecology. Um, it, it will absolutely have to be personalist and individual and grassroots. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess that was just me saying amen. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Okay, one, ooh, that puts a lot of pressure on me here. And I'm so sorry, this is very small print and it's a lot of questions coming up now. Um, let's see. Um, hold on. Lots coming up here about renewal. Again, um, different ways to see. Uh, uh, actually, I, I think I'm gonna go with like the, a kind of personal fi final one. Several of these are asking about your relationship how you met, and um, there's one here that I don't even really know the context of. It says, David and Anne, how did you, how, how did or have you reconciled the religious differences in your marriage? So I think that might be, so how, how you met, if you just want to leave us with a word about your relationship, that might be an appropriately personalist, individual <laughs> kind of moment, about your differences, your commonalities, and maybe even also your own habits of conversation and hospitality, the hospitality that you give to each other as persons and the hospitality that you give to the other people who are around you. I'll, I'll start again. Well, we met, uh, Anne mentioned Dorothy Day. I was writing a book called The Road to Character and Anne did research on Dorothy Day and other people in that book. So we met that way. And then uh, some, well, pretty much simultaneously, uh, I had been raised uh, in a Jewish home, but I went to a, a Christian camp and a Christian school so I'd been raised with both these stories rattling around in my head. Uh, and then uh, I call myself religiously bisexual in those days. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, but it didn't matter because I, I didn't believe in God either anyway, so it didn't matter. They were just stories. Uh, and then gradually over life in one of these complicated circumstances, um, the way I would put it, the, materialist categories I had for the world did not match the spiritual and transcendent experiences I had in the world. Mm. And so I came to consider the possibility there might be a God. Uh, and so I became curious, I became a searcher and I became curious about Christianity. And the first thing I learned is when you're searching, uh, Christians give you books. <laughs> and so within a couple of months, I got five or 600 books. <laughs> My joke is only 350 of which were different copies of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. <laughs> um, but I was searching this, and it must have been while we were working on the book, and, but I did know a Christian. And so I would send Anne emails, like, how does this work? 
And then the, the, one, the one I remember most vividly is like, how do you earn grace? Like, what do I have to do to earn grace? And she writes back, that's really not how it works. And, uh, <laughs> and so we exchanged a bunch of long emails. Uh, and it was just part of the journey. Uh, and I had the most, aside from that, I had the most boring gradual conversion, if you want to call it that, mm. which felt like coming to faith. I feel more Jewish now than I ever felt mm. because I think the story I read is true. Yes. But I also, as I say, I can't unread Matthew. Right. And to me, the, the Beatitudes are the, the spiritual moment when divinity really comes down to earth. Mm. And the way I put it um, is that it's like you're, I was sitting on a train and I'm sitting around people, everything's kind of normal. Everyone's around me, we're eating paper, stripping our coffee. And you look out the window uh, and um, you realize you've, you, there's a long way behind you. You're not in the world of atheism or agnosticism anymore. You, somehow you've crossed a boundary into faith. Hmm. And so then it was a question of determining what that would look like. Hmm. And that's still a journey I'm on. I, I'm, I don't write, a, I write a little about faith, but I don't write much because I'm not, I don't feel qualified. I've, I know so, so many people who know, who sp feel it deeply and I just, just seem more profound about it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I do feel it. Um, and so Anne was part of the learning process. And the only thing I'll say about our relationship, then you can say what a self-absorbed ass I am at home. Um, <laughs> is that there was a time when uh, little embers began to fly between us and Anne decided it was not something that should happen. Uh, and so she moved to Houston and we were not in communication for a while. And, and so I couldn't talk to her. And so I, the only way I could communicate with her was I have a column in the New York Times. <laughs> uh, and so, I wrote a whole bunch of columns that I knew were only directed at her. <laughs> and so one of them was called The Love Story about the relationship between a philosopher, Isaiah Berlin, and a poet, Russian poet named Anna Akhmatova. Mm -hmm. And it was about a couple, they just had one night together, they just talked mm -hmm. about poetry and drama. And like, that was just directed at her. And then when <laughs> things got really bad and things seemed like hopeless, and I used to write stories about the Middle East. And they were nominally about the Middle East. One was called a tragic situation. <laughs> and so, and that was a way to communicate. And <laughs> eventually, obviously, she changed her mind, but it took a long time. Were you reading in between all those lines? I have to ask you, did you get that they were for you? Um, yes, I did get that okay. they were for me. <laughs> wow, wow. This is a personal story I've never shared, but I'll just do it here. Um, I, was, I went out with somebody in Houston where I was. It was like a casual restaurant dinner date, and it was the second time, and he said, halfway through, he's like, I read this column today that just captures exactly how I think what we could have. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> So life can get a little meta sometimes. Um, yeah, on the religious differences, um, which I, that's a strong way of putting it. I, I think um, you are a secular writer that is very much your kind of public profile and vocation. And he would joke that kind of coming to Christian faith when you did was like joining the, investing in the stock market in 1928 or 1929. It just was not a great time in the American church world or kind of a, just a perplexing time of weakness and division obviously and um, just like where are you kind of, um, where is the radical countercultural thing here that could be such a light? Um, and so I think you, we've both been discouraged by that. That hasn't been a helpful thing for like a shared canopy of shared um, spiritual growth. But I think there's just a, um, there's, there is such a shared curiosity about uh, how humans flourish and like the intricacies of the human person that feel like a deeply spiritual quest and I would say there's some, there is something in the peoplehood of as you say you be, you feel more Jewish the more Christian you become you feel more Jewish there's something in that um, wisdom tradition and the peoplehood aspect of it that has been like a huge gift to my own sort of Gentile understanding of the life of Christian faith um, 
and I can't quite explain it, but the 50 year or whatever we have, 30 year conversation um, feels imbued very much with a sense of faith seeking understanding in all aspects of life. So I actually don't feel religiously different mm -hmm. per se. I think we probably just, I come in with more years of certain spiritual practices and being around the fragrance of it for quite a bit longer. And um, yeah, we, there are, we talk. Yeah, there are certain things that she just knows, you know, that go to Wheaton College, a lifetime in the faith. <laughs> uh, they're just things you know. Um, yeah, I had one story to tell, but now I've forgotten what it is. Um, yeah, I, I once wrote a piece for Anne's Magazine, which is one of the pieces I'm most proud of, called Jesus is a Jew. Uh, and it was seeing Jesus through the Jerusalem lens, not through the Florence, the Renaissance Italy lens, yeah. not through the American evangelical lens, but just as this guy in a war-torn place filled with revolution who walks into Jerusalem and takes all the power structures and just throws them all up. Mm. And that Jewish Jesus is just a total badass. <laughs> uh, and so it, th seeing through that lens, I, I treasure that lens. Mm. And I will say we, we've been talking occasionally and through the day about this TV show, The Chosen, which for those of you who have not read it, I recommend it. Watched they do a, it. Watched it. Or watched it, yeah. Um, they do a very good job mm. of placing him within the Jewish context. Uh, they all speak in this vaguely Hebrew accent. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't feel we have too much religious difference. I'm just, Ben has way more de developed spiritual practices. Yeah, Prayer maybe drink. just one follow-up question then. I, I'm sorry, but I love this comment that you said that, that coming to Christian faith at the moment that you did is like, investing in the stock market in 1928. I just, I'm sorry, that really tickles me. But, um, uh, I, you know, I do think, I have a sense that this is actually a very hopeful moment to be a Christian. And the reason that I think that um, is not because church attendance is declining or all the other things, it, 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 it is actually because the church attendance is declining and that some of the problems, it is and it isn't, because many of the problems that we have in American Christianity are things that just need to die away. I mean, the, the problems that are caused this, this lack of compassion, this lack of care, the social bifurcations that we have, like there are just problems uh, of like American Christianity being invested in uh, an idolatry of the nation and an idolatry of wealth post-World War II, that actually if those things die away, then there might be a, a more genuine resurgence of what it means to have, in your words, a, a badass Christian faith. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was actually putting itself into practice, like yeah. in all the ways, the mysticism, the prayer, the sacramentality, and the social action, because for Jesus of Nazareth, that is all one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a friend who's a Baptist pastor in Northern Virginia, and he started sprinkling his sermons with sentences from the Sermon on the Mount. And people would say, yeah, I, I like the sermon, but I didn't like those woke parts in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> The woke Jesus. Okay, there we have it. Uh, all this on that controversial note, can we give them a hand? This has been a marvelous evening.